Recently, I wrote an article on my website about fluent interfaces in TypeScript, and this is something I've been playing around with a bunch recently, so I thought it'd be a fun thing to share that with you guys in a video here as well. Of course, if you prefer reading, you can check out the blog post. I'll have it linked down below, but I wanted to walk through some of the examples and give you a little bit more color on what's going on here. Even if you've never heard of a fluent interface, you've probably used one. jQuery is, I think, the first fluent interface that I use. I've got a simple example of some jQuery query here. The other one that we probably use all the time is testing assertion libraries, something like this, where we say expect not to contain or expect to be equal to or to be falsy or to be truthy. The main idea of a fluent interface is that the library or the API provides you with a way to chain method calls together, usually with the goal of creating a higher level DSL that you can use to get whatever job you're trying to do done. And it should be a little bit simpler than traditional object method calls or just calling functions and composing pieces of a library. Let's take a look at a basic example, and I'm going to scroll down to where I have a link to the TypeScript playground and let's take a look at this example of a kind of very basic, simple way to do a fluent interface in TypeScript. We're using a class here and we're creating a query builder class. And this is all about creating a SQL query. We can call select and pass a list of columns that we want to select. And we just store that off in fields. You could call from and add a table where you want to be able to select those columns from. And then you could call where, and that takes a column and then a value and we'll record those. And right now we're just doing equality comparisons in this where. So this is very simple. And then finally, we have a build method here. Something to note in select and from and where is that all of them return this. And that's essentially what allows us to do the chaining, right? Every time we call our function, we perform some action and then we return this from select and from and where. If you're returning this from a function, that should tell us kind of two things about the way a fluent interface works. Firstly, it tells us that this is probably not, at least in this case, a pure function, right? There's some kind of side effects going on. If the only thing we cared about is our inputs and our outputs, and our output is always the same object, this is not particularly useful. And so that must mean there's some state side effects going on. And of course, in this case, we do have side effects happening. If there were no side effects, then these functions wouldn't be doing anything at all. So we're storing off fields, we're storing off table, we're storing off the where value. Now build is a little bit different. Build is kind of our terminal case, right? We need some way to kind of exit, if you will, from the object that we're working with here. Otherwise, a lot of the work that we've been doing in these other calls is not that useful. And so you can see build really simply creates a SQL string. We do our select and then join our fields from our table where, and then we create a where clause. And so this is pretty straightforward to use. We can new up a query builder here. Then we can select some columns. We can say what table we're selecting them from. We can add a where clause and then we can call build. And if we look at query, we see we have a type of string and you can see when we run this, we get select name and email from users where ID is one. We could very easily add a new where here or an additional where I should say. We could say where email. Now you can see we actually have two parts where ID is one and email is androidexample.com. So you can see this is a pretty basic example and creating a query like this is, is pretty natural. You've probably used libraries like this before. It feels familiar because a fluent interface is commonly used when you're building queries like this. In fact, this is kind of as close to writing SQL as we can be while we're writing JavaScript or TypeScript, right? And so this is a basic example of what a fluent interface might look like in TypeScript or in JavaScript. Now, to be honest, there's not a lot of types going on here. We have some basic types for our columns and, and table names and stuff like that. But we're going to look at a more complex query builder example uh, in a couple of minutes. Now, you might think we have to use classes and objects like this if we're going to do a fluent interface because we need a place to store the state that we're capturing, right? Remember that these functions here that return this need to also store some state, otherwise they're kind of doing nothing at all. However, we can look at another example here, which is this piping example. So this piping example is kind of interesting. It seems much simpler, but there's a little bit more going on. Okay, we have a pipe function that takes another function as its argument. And notice that this function takes an A and returns a B. So it kind of transforms our value for us, right? And we're using A and B as generics here. We create a new function here called run, which takes an A and it returns function of A. So it just returns a B. And this function run is pretty basic and that's exactly what we return here. If that was all that this is, then really it's kind of pointless. But the magic comes when we add a property to run, run.pipe. So we can add new properties to functions like this. And what we do here is we have this function that has some other generic argument C. 
and it takes a function that goes from B to C, right? So we have a function here that goes from A to B. We are now taking a function that goes from B to C. And this calls pipe, which is our outside pipe function here. It calls it with a function that takes A and returns function 2 of function of a. And so this expression here is a function that goes from a through b to c. What we've created now is another pipe function that goes from a to c. And if you think about this kind of recursively, what this means is now we can chain as many of these functions together as possible, transforming our data from one to the next and kind of create a pipeline, hence the name of functions or a chain of links for our data to pass through. So let's look at an example of it here. We call pipe down here on line 14. We start by passing it data.parse. Data.parse is a function that takes a string and returns a number. And so now when we call dot pipe off of that, we don't even have to say what this n here is. We can see the parameter is a number. And so we can pass it to new date. Then in our next pipe here, d, of course, is a date, we convert it to a string, s is a string, so we split it on t, a now is a string array. And so we can grab the two parts of that and return it to an object that has a date and a time property. And so with all of this piping in place now, what is the result? Well, string to date and time is a function that takes a string and returns a date and time. Now notice it also has a pipe, which has a, a kind of a deep type here, because of course we could continue piping forever. But if we ignore that and look at the very first piece here, it takes a string and returns our object with a date and time. And so if we go ahead and call this here result and I do console log, then you can see over here, we have date and time. And of course this time is my offset from UTC. And so we're creating a very specific fluent interface here. Really it's a fluent interface of just one function dot pipe, which allows us to chain together other function calls. Because of the way we're using generics, we can do this strongly. Now you might say, well, hold on a second, because you're not returning this, you're not returning an object anywhere at all. How are we keeping the state as we go? And what we're doing really here is using closure. Right? So when we return run here, this run function, we have the value of fn here in our closure. And so we'll always have access to that. And then anytime we call pipe on a run, which is happening in kind of all of these scenarios, we are capturing function two in another closure. And so we have function two and function, and both are accessible through closure. So basically what we're doing here is we're using closure as our object private properties or our object state, if you will. There's one other thing that I think this example demonstrates pretty nicely. And this is not always true, I guess, of fluent interfaces, or maybe I should say it doesn't need to be true, but it often is. And that is that when we're chaining these functions together like this, the behavior that it kind of looks like is happening here isn't actually happening yet. We're kind of enqueuing these actions for later, right? When we're piping all of these functions through, passing these functions to pipe, uh, we're not actually calling them. We're not actually, there's no data flowing through any of these until I call our function and get a result back. All of these are just kind of being queued up. Now that might seem obvious, but I mention it for two reasons. First of all, because I think it's important to understand uh, when work is actually happening. If any of these functions here were referencing other data through closure here, that's something that we might want to be aware of when we're writing this code, when we're consuming this library. Uh, the other thing too, though, is that you always want to think about what is our terminal condition that actually kind of tips that first domino that kind of triggers the work that we're doing here. If we go back to the query builder example for just a second, when we're calling select and from and where we're certainly not hitting a database with a query, but we're not even really creating a query string yet. It's not until we call build that we actually put it all together and have a string. In this example here, whenever I call pipe, we're not actually uh, calling new date or to ISO string or splitting into an array or creating an object. All of those are actions that we're just queuing up to happen when we actually call the resulting function at the end. That's something important to keep in mind and knowing what your terminal condition is can be a really important thing to think about when you're creating these types of fluent interfaces. Okay, we're gonna look at one more example here and um, I don't show this in the blog post, but because we're in a video form here, I can do that. Let's start here with a little bit more of an advanced query builder that actually has some interesting strong types in place. We're going to go over this kind of briefly because there's a lot of type related stuff here that is fascinating to dig into, but not really the point of this video. I want to show you how it can be used and not um, kind of how to build it. So we have a query builder here. It takes uh, as a generic argument, a set of tables where this is really just an object of table name to 
some kind of base table. Base table, very simple, column name to, I'm keeping it simple again, I keep saying simple in this example, string number or Boolean. There are three things we can do in this query builder. We can put a new table into action here and notice that this creates a new query builder. We're going to come back to that in a second here. We can select some columns or we can where. And so notice I haven't actually implemented this. That gets a lot more complex. There's a lot more code there. And I want to look at mainly how we use this API and not how we would build it on the inside. Select and where have the pretty normal case. We implement some kind of state handling here and then we return this. We've already seen that. With table, we're doing something a little bit different. The purpose of this table function, as you can see, it doesn't take any arguments and it just returns a new query builder. Really all it's doing is changing this table's generic type that we pass in here. We have some set of tables that we start with and then table takes a string n, which is the name of the table, t, which is another base table, and it extends or intersects a table with that new field. We also have some pretty interesting strong types here for select and for where. We have a helper here called columns, which basically just iterates through all of the tables we have and creates strings where we have table name dot column name, right? And so that's how we can reference any column uh, in any of the tables that we have set up in our query builder here. And so we can get strong typing when we're doing our select. We'll look at that in just a second here. Then in the where, we have the same thing. We're using columns in order to get strong typing on the columns. And then also we pass that column to something we're calling here flat tables. What this does is it basically takes our nested table structure, creates a flat version where we have columns for keys and of course the existing value for values. And that way we can make sure if we're calling where, we're passing the correct type as our value for that column. I went over columns and flats here uh, kind of very quickly, but let me show you what we can do. Now we can create a brand new query builder here. We can say we have a table here called user, with an ID and a name column. And now when we go to select, let's actually, and notice that when I open a quote here and I start typing U for user, we have two different things auto completing here, user.id and user.name. And so it knows that I can call user.name. Now, if I try something else like user.age, notice we have a type error here. User age not assignable to user ID or username. If I do where, I can say where user uh, ID equals Andrew. Ah, oh, we have another type error. This time it tells us that string is not assignable to parameter of type number. It knows that ID here is a number column. And so we really can't do this. So we have to say where ID equals one, something like that. If we were to change this from ID to name, now we get a type error saying number not assignable to string. And so we have to go back to our string. The other th neat thing you can do is, and we're seeing that in this example here, is we can add new tables. And notice that this is what's going on here in our table function. We are creating a new type. We're extending the type type of tables. And to do that, we need to create a new query builder. This is something that is important specifically in TypeScript. If you want to create a, a chainable interface like this, and you want the type of kind of that underlying object to be able to mutate over time as the user performs some actions, well, then what you're going to need to be able to do is create new objects that have different types. We can't change, if we scroll back down here to our example, we can't change the type of Q, the initial query builder. However, what we can do is when we call table here, we can return a new query builder and continue to chain off of that. And this query builder now has a different type. You can notice if I hover over tables, what we return is this query builder with a user and we're intersecting that with the widget type now. And so now we have access to both tables. Once we augment our type like that, now we can do select on widget ID, select widget user ID. And of course we get strong typing here on the widget related stuff as well. And I should point out just to be clear, we can always mix this. So we can do user.name when we're selecting here. Of course, we've already selected that uh, up here, but you get the idea of how this could work. Now, this is kind of a stripped down version of a little side project I was working on recently, and I hope I can get back to this soon. Uh, but this is an, essentially a selector class where uh, the goal of this is to be able to um, parse values as well, not just uh, create queries. I have a little library that I created called parse, which is kind of like my own version of Zod. And you use Zod shapes here to create your query. And this is complex, so I'm not going to try and explain it now. 
definitely take a look at the code here if you want. If you're interested in another video where I walk through this code, uh, we could totally do that. But you can see uh, what we're doing here is something similar where we have tables as part of our selector here. We also have an outbound shape that we're trying to build up as we go. And the constructor here takes those things. We call this new constructor in a bunch of places where we assign a new table, set a new field, select returns new selector, uh, value of course doesn't. Uh, we got some internal stuff here, including our two SQL, which is kind of our, our terminal condition here. If we go back to um, the tests here, you can kind of see this in an action where I'm using a very, very similar syntax to Zod. You can create your user, you can create your widget, and then we can create a new selector, pass those tables through. We can say user ID, as user ID, widget.id as widget ID, value, and then you can see we can actually parse an object like this and match it against a shape, as well as get out a pretty decent query. Early days for this little project, this is just something I'm doing for fun. Those are some fun things you can do when you're trying to create these types of fluent interfaces. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Keasley just before we end here. Keasley is a pretty cool library that essentially is a query builder library that does a lot of this. And I think I had a video, oh, was it more than a year ago now? about trying to implement the Keasley type safety. There's a uh, way more to Keasley than my little projects, but if you want to see any of the coder examples we've looked at in this video, you can go check out this blog post uh, over on my website, shaky.sh. I will have a link to this underneath the video. If you know other really good libraries that uh, you have enjoyed using that use a fluent interface like this, I would love to hear about them. So send those my way, leave them in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.